I'm Tony Schumacher, and these are my Ignite Insights. I wanted to be a writer when I was a little kid. There used to be a thing on um, BBC One, no, BBC Two of an afternoon. Grandstand was on BBC One. BBC Two on a Saturday afternoon, and he'd always put our films on, like like Al Weston's and the um, uh, old, like, you know, Cary Grant films and all that kind of stuff, and Humphrey Bogart and all this kind of stuff. Like, I didn't necessarily want to be Cary Grant. It might surprise you, but I wanted to, like, make that stuff. Mm. And then I, I love books. I was forever reading books. It was like, uh, like always in the library, Saturday morning, go to village with me, Monday night in village, which was like a shopping centre where we lived. And then um, I go to the library and I just sit there like plowing through books, you know, bring on like a big pile of books. So I knew, like I just wanted to write. My problem was, was that I was thick and I couldn't get my head around um, school and education. I just had no ability to like, um, process what I was being told. I still don't know. I just had no process of it. And I'd like, I'd go into something and I'd think, oh, I've got this, I'm brilliant, I've got it. Like within the first 80 seconds, I'd be like, hey, how much yet? How fractions yet? That easiness. And then within like two minutes of realizing that I hadn't got it, I'd just lose all interest yeah. in it. And I was the same with English. And the only thing I could do was write like essay stories. Mm-hmm. But things like nouns, verbs, adverbs, pronouns, I still don't know what they are. You know, people go to me, it's just a doing word. What does that even mean? You know what I mean? And I was a kid. I just couldn't get my head around it, but I knew I wanted to be a writer. And then I got to 16 when I did my O-levels, GCSEs, and um, I failed. I got a U in the English language. And I thought, right, that's it. I think it's improved now. I work with a couple of schools now, uh, doing mentor and stuff like that, Like, which is hopefully like it's... Mm. You know, hopefully it has changed. I think teachers are, are like an early up against it now with curriculums and stuff like that. So I'm loads of slagging anyone off. Like, but I'd hate to think that like kids thought they were limited by exams. Yeah. But they probably are told it. They yeah. are like the turning point was forty no, it wasn't forty years, it was about twenty five years later. No, it was more than that actually, you know. So you went like twenty odd, thirty odd years of thinking. Didn't write to think. Did not write a thing. Did not like write any kind of. Still love films. Still love telling. Still love reading. Um, but just thought it was not for me. Mm-hmm. And then I had a nervous breakdown. I was a busy. I was a copper. And I had a, a nervous breakdown where I just I lost everything. I ended up being homeless, and I ended up like living in my car and um, quit my job and everything. And I had this moment. The only good thing that I had was. Well, I had two good things. I had my dog. And um, the other thing was, I didn't have addiction issues. And I think if I'd had addiction issues, I would have been out there yeah. on the streets. Mm-hmm. But I didn't. I, I I was able to sort of, once I started, my mental health started improving again. I was able to think, I could do something. I could do anything now because I haven't got anything to lose. So I started casting an arm, what am I going to do? And I did a little bit of stand-up comedy and did a little bit of acting. And I was all right at both of them. Like, and I, I, I did okay. By this point, by the way, I, I was driving a taxi. Yeah. I kind of got me, me act together enough to be able to like get a job and, and get somewhere to live. And I was driving a taxi. So I sort of, I cast around like trying to do these different things, like a bit of acting, a bit of stand-up. And I did a Ken Loach film and I did a couple of plays and stuff. And um, I, there was two things really, if I'm being brutally honest. One is, I was in a play that wasn't very good. And I remember thinking, I could make this play better. Really? Yeah, like literally having a moment thinking, oh, this isn't like great, you know? Mm-hmm. But like, I, I can't say nothing. I'd like, who am I to say something? Yeah. And when I kind of, that, that like sort of, somebody's written this, like it's in a book. Yeah. Who am I to say something? But I was genuinely thinking to myself, I can't make this better. Mm-hmm. And two was, I was driving the taxi one night and a lady got in the cab who used to edit an online magazine and she said to me, um, you know, she said like, this is what I do for a living. And I said to her, I'm a writer. And I I don't know why I said it because I'd written nothing since I was 16 years old, yeah. I never said it, I never said it to anyone. And uh, she said it to me like, I'm I'm a writer. I, I, I said it, sorry, I just blurted it out. And she said, what do you write about? And I went to say, oh, stuff that happens in the taxi. 
And she was like, oh, right, that's something really interesting. Send me some of your stuff. And I went, yeah, I will do. Cheers yeah, now, yeah. Tarana. And she gave me a card, like, and she got out the card, and I was like, oh, no, I've got nothing written. I literally had nothing written. And it was just hell. But then um, I, went, I went home and wrote something. And then I sent it to her, and I went to bed, because I wrote it that night, and I think I went to bed about six in the morning. And um, I got up at about nine o'clock to take the dog out, because being a taxi driver is just the hardest job on earth. And um, she'd sent me an email saying, I love it, what else have you got? And that was it, that was it, off you go, you know, yeah. Ken. Ken. Love. Ken, love. The thing about Ken was, I, I'd done a bit of stand-up with uh, John Bishop, and um, they were looking for someone to play John's brother. Mm. It was only a small part. And they phoned me up and said, um, can you come and do uh, this, you know? Mm. So, yeah, all right. So I went down to um, audition for the role, and I met Ken. Um, and I remember walking in the room, just seeing this, this half fella like, sitting in the corner, and just thinking, oh my God, this guy's done like, some of the most influential work in the world. But he was so like lovely and humble and, and nice and I was a bag of nerves. I was a yeah. proper bag of nerves. We had this scene where I was playing a, an angry scouser in a pub, which I'll be honest with you, wasn't much of a stretch. And um he had me um he kept coming over to me and the thing about Ken is he keeps he, he's brilliant for saying just um improvise like have a go. Just imp- just t- try something else, you know, I'd like the script like and he was saying, just try it, just do something else, just improvise, do more stuff, do more stuff. And I had this moment where I was thinking, this is a brilliant opportunity for me, but I couldn't do it. Mm. I couldn't, I don't know why, I don't know if it was nerves, or I don't know what it was, but I couldn't, like, just throw myself completely into the scene. Yeah. And I think that was a moment where I, like, that was one of the moments where I thought to myself, I'm not, I'm not a great actor. Mm. But the writer, comes up with a script and Ken really encourages people to have a go. Mm. Just play with it and do more stuff with it. And I hate that. Yeah. I do. I'm terrible, mate. I, I've got this like thing about like where like um I've spent like years in pro- like writing that script yeah. and then you'll have some actor come along and they'll go just completely say a completely different line. Yeah. And it's like, no, you know what I mean? That's the line, just learn it. And one thing I le- one thing I found is working on responding, it, which it's like the the names, like Ian Hart and, and Martin. I thought it was really strange was the they don't improvise. Like Ian Hart's amazing. Ian like knows the script, doesn't even look at a page. It's amazing. Martin's quite like that actually. But Ian just doesn't even know. He's just like he'll just come on set and sit down and bang. And it's it's perfect, the beats and everything. Yeah. And I think this is really important. I think what really, really, really elevates a script in the eyes of someone who's reading it is the rhythm of the language. So if you say it out loud loads, if you like properly say it out loud when you write something, I act it out, I act out every part of my script. Yeah, yeah, yeah God, yeah. I act it all out sitting in my office of the night. And I, like, luckily enough, my wife and I is brilliantly understanding, like, because I'm like walking back and forwards. Because even the shouty bits, yeah. you've got to act them out because they, they don't sound it right. Sounds- yeah, it's yeah. only yet to sound right. But like the likes of Ian and all that, they, like they will like nail it perfectly. They will know the script. And then you get like someone who comes in, like who was my level of acting, who will come in and just improvise loads. And it, it's weird. It's weird. I don't understand it. And I wonder if it's like a, a, a professionalism or whatever. I don't know. But like, but that's the difference between me and Ken. Yeah. Is that like I hate it? Yeah, yeah. Like no, no script. But I was fascinated watching Ken work. It as a director, and I love the idea of, he's like, I mean, any director's the same, really, to some extent, like, but, who I've worked with, anyway, is that, they're like, colonels, you know, in the army sort of thing, that none of them do any shouting, they have, like, sergeants to do all the shouting, like, and they're, like, kind of, like, slightly elevated, slightly step back, yeah, God, it is, yeah, but Ken was, like, brilliant, because, um, you never saw him telling anyone to do anything, working with, he's so quiet, he's so quiet and set, and like, like there was some, we had some fantastic directors on Responde, like Phil Barantini and uh, Fien Troch and, and the uh, Tim Newlands was like a god, mm. brilliant. And not one of them was loud. Not one of them was loud. Yeah. Every one of them was like nearly quiet, nearly 
you know, and Drew stuff for other people. Yeah. I watched Phil Barantini work and he was just on boiling point with Stephen Graham. And he, Phil's going to be huge, going to be a massive yeah. director. And you watch Phil work and, and he spends half his time just whispering in people's ears. Or just having little quiet words, you yeah. know, and, and walking up, you know, just little just tiny little, little yeah, yeah, there's none of this like big stuff. And uh, uh, Tom Hanks talks about uh, Clint Eastwood and uh, he said like, it, it's like, it just, everything is like in that Clint Eastwood, like, get a Clint Eastwood, get a whisper. It's like everything, and everyone's still leaning in to listen to him. That respect even more because you have to be drawn into Yeah, you've got to lean in to listen yeah. to it, yeah. But like, you know, and yet, I've done stuff where the director's been like shouty. Mm. Um, um, it's not great, like. Yeah. It's not great, like. It's just weird. Yeah, she steps into but Ken was very, Ken was very small and very like quiet and thingy. And the other, th- the other thing I liked about Ken was, was that one he knew everyone's name, or two, in like the the uh, the canteen, you know, during your breaks, like mm. he he would like um, he wanders around and chats to everyone. Like yeah, it's sit like on the on the you know we sit with the, the extras support yeah. actors. He yeah. sits with no, I can say extras because they used to be one, but like he'd sit with them guys, you know, or he'd yeah. sit with wardrobe, or he'd sit with the sparks, or whatever, you know. He just floats around, mm. and just like it wasn't just like oh he's the star, you know. I've got yeah, to sit with yeah. them. He's brilliant, he can. Yeah, great. That's You've got to work hard. You, you, it's so. Oh, it's so like, I, I think because everyone, including me, when I started, was looking for the answer, looking for the, the magic, looking for the trick. How do you do it? You know, there must be a lot of way to do it. There must be a way. And I realised, like, you've just got to work harder than, yeah. than them. Do you know, like, it's a real conscious decision. I've just got to work harder than them. And, like, this is why I've got massive bags under my eyes, you know. It's like, this is, like, why, like, I, you know, I'm here on a bank college. Yeah. I'll tell you what my day was like, and this isn't me going, oh, look at me, I'm like fucking dead ass. It's not, like, it's not, but this is like the, this is what my day used to be. This job has cost me relationships for the kick-off. I mean, quite definitely cost me relationships. To the point that there was, a, there's one of them, and God forgive me, I'm a horrible person, but there was one of them where I said to the fantastic lady involved, I haven't got time for this, because I'm going there, and this is, I, I'm gone. Like, and that's the end of that. And I, when I drove the taxi, I would, I'd go up in the cab at six o'clock in the evening. I'd wait till about four in the morning. I'd go to bed till about nine. Mm-hmm. I'd get up and walk the dog, and then I would write till about five. There was a thing the other week about, I, I did a, a talk for the writers the other week, and some fella sent me a tweet afterwards and said, um, it's all right, just say a work harder. Um, I've submitted 15 things, and I've never got anywhere. And it's like, mate, 15 things is nothing. Why are you even saying that? Why are you even sending it to me? 15 things, that's all you've done. Mm-hmm. It's like, fucking hell, mate. You know, I did that on Tuesday. It's like, don't talk to me about 10 years and 15 things. You've got to work harder than anyone else because you know you're looking at that room and you go, yeah, do you know what? You went to private school, you went to board school, you did this, you did that. And I haven't got a chip on my shoulder about it because I... I Listen, I've got an eight-month-old baby, and if he's got to go to private school to get where I am, and as doesn't have to work as that, yeah. I'm all over it. I can afford it. I only go to private school. I'm that much of a hypocrite. But at the same time, I can look at it and go, you know, the sense of satisfaction I've got from, like, that graft mm. is immense. And also, it's made me a better writer as well. It's definitely made me a better writer. And also... Coming, having this background, it gives me an authenticity. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not going to write down so, yeah. but it's but like then Julian Fellows couldn't write what I write. Exactly. So use it, you know, yeah. use that. The thing about Jimmy is, um, he used to be a teacher, and within about five minutes you realise he's the best teacher you never had. Yeah. He's brilliant and. The one thing about Jimmy is though is that he has this ability to really hone in on what is good, mm-hmm. like what is good about what story you can tell. I took him in this idea for this um, big thing about drugs and running around and all this and gun crime and driving up and down roads really fast. Yeah, drama. Yeah, you know, drama. God, yeah, that weird. And um, and Jimmy 
was brilliant in that team. He just went, you know what? Like that's great. Like, but put you in it. Like find that tiny, tiny little bit of you and put it in it, and then that'll be the thing that becomes the thing that sells it. And he's dead right. There's like 50 people out there right now, just within about five miles of where we're sitting, writing stuff that everyone's already seen. Yeah. And he said, "You like what Jimmy's brilliant at doing is go and find the thing in you that nobody's seen, and then just pull that out and develop it, and that'll be the thing that becomes." Responding, yeah. yeah. What I do is I come up with like a, a really generic idea. Like I'll, I'll come up with like something like, like really quite like boringly generic. But then what you do is you kind of I go away, and I, I never pitch it. I never talk to anyone. You know, I literally I'll come up with something like I, I might write something about like gambling. I might do something about gambling. Yeah, and then what you do is. I, you go away and you go, like, it's that Jimmy thing is, how can I shrink this down to, like, the smallest component, like, the absolute smallest, most important thing, like, and, and get the thing that nobody else has seen and look for that magic. Mm. Because if I can't remember the idea, mm. it's probably not a great idea. Mm. So I'll have that generic thing and then I'll spend weeks thinking about it, weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months yeah. just thinking about it looking for a little bit of magic yeah. and then when I get the magic and it might be a line I have a thing where I might like come out with a line so and, you send it yeah and that'll be like it might be an open scene or it might just be like an argument or it might just be even just something really nothing yeah. like on responding it was the the scene between Marco and Chris mm. in the car in episode one that was the scene, oh, that was the that was the thing that that was the point where I went right. That's it. I want to write that show. That's me talking to me. Yeah. That was that was the internet show because I was Michael. I was the Scully. I was the young lad living in height. And he was like, you know, working class and ducking and diving and me half and always on strike and me mum working in a biscuit factory. Yeah. Like that was me. And then I become Chris the Bobby, and it, it literally it was thematically for me that was me talking to me in the back of the car. And that was all it was. And then obviously, once it's written, there's a couple of lines in there that never got used, some of them, but there's like, there's lines in there which is literally me talking to me. And then all I did was, as time went on, and you draft it, and you draft it, and you turn it into a part of the show. Because yeah. often, the thing that gets you into it, the other thing that I do, is I'll often write scenes that you don't, I know are never going to be in the end script. I just absolutely know they're not going to be in the end script. And it might be something really trivial, like um, Chris with Kate, Chris with his wife. Or it might just be Chris locking someone up, because I'll learn about that personality. That's a character development then, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, but I'll write it, like, properly write the script. And sometimes you might throw them in. You know, you might go, oh, that's all right, I'll use that. But other times you just think it is... And also, like, if I'm writing a scene, I'll often just overwrite it by five pages of dialogue. Because you get the rhythm and the sound of the character and you feel it and you know them. And like, you can't, you've got to like, it, it's a nightmare for my wife, but you can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. You just can't stop thinking about it. It's so either, you know, I'm thinking about something else I'm working yeah. on. And it's like, whilst, if I'm not talking, I'm thinking about it. That's all right, you've got to work at it. It's another world though, isn't it, that you created? Yeah. That you're going to be... yeah. It's a universe, it's yeah. a world, it's a universe. Yeah. And you've got, you, you just, you literally live with it. I had a coffee the other day, 92 degrees, and I was sitting there, like, and it, about, after about, I don't know, about five minutes, I realised I was mumbling to myself, having a conversation with, with a character. I know, it's mad, isn't it? You know, he's like, what's wrong with me? You know, it's all right where I live, because people know, like, I'm a weirdo, but it's like, you know, we're like, in, like, in a coffee shop, what are you doing, you know? It's so strange, but it's the best job in the world. When you've got the script finished, you probably haven't got it finished. I, mean, I know that sounds terrible, but you probably haven't got it finished. It's like, I, like, it's incredibly there that I write something and go, that's it. Mm -hmm. It's like, and if you're doing three drafts, somebody sent me a short film the other day, script, and said, will you read this? And I went, yeah, and she, she said to me, I've, I've, like, I've written it, like, it's about the third draft. And I thought, I wouldn't even... I'm embarrassed to let the computer see a third draft, <laughs> let alone somebody else. It's like, it, their draft is like, it's nothing. Mm. 
And like it's you know, and you've got to keep shaving it and shaving it and tightening it and making it smaller and making it you know like tighter and tighter. And when I write something as well, I never I write visually like in my head. I write like um, I see I look at the scenes at me like in my head. I don't like I literally don't look at the keyboard and and like my eyes are like on the screen. Mm -hmm. But I always do that thing. Like Michael Caine talks about it, where getting in as tight as you can to the face. Mm. So when I'm writing something, if there's like if it's a three hundred or something like that, a scene, I'm like every scene in my head is just on the face of the character talking, because that's the most important part. You know, you know, and it was a buddy cop film. They'd been done millions and millions of times, but what made it brilliant was the attention to detail with the language. It was like that. So that's a, like so. If you think you finished your script, you haven't. Really focus on the faces, as they say in the words. Um, but yeah, what you do with it? Like, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. I got lucky with my first script. It was a thing that hasn't been made yet. It's called The Estate. And um, I sent it to a production company in Liverpool, primarily because it didn't know what it was doing. Yeah. And it was, I got lucky because I'd spent so long. One, I put the most interesting character in the script on the first page. And it doesn't matter if they're not supposed to be there. Like, the most interesting character's got to be on the first page. Like, it... Because the script that you give to the production company, it, it, that isn't the one that's going to get made. It's not going to get made, because they're going to want to have input to it. Like, Dancing Ledge Productions, who may respond there, I've seen their pile of scripts. Honest to God, it, it needs yellow tape putting around there. If it fell over it, it'd kill you. It's like, it's about 30 foot high with these br millions of scripts. And if, if it isn't going to grab you on the first half page, what are you going to do? Yeah. You're not going to keep going to page 30 to, yeah. till the protagonist turns up. I spoke to a guy from the writers' room who told me a story about how uh, they put a shout out for a, 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 a soap and just said spec scripts. You know, like just to see what people could do. And he said, I, we got this big man pile of scripts and he's flicking through them, you know. He's like, it's really good writing, that's really good writing, that's really good writing. And he got to about the 10th or 12th or 20th one and he'd written the episode as a musical. And he went, bang, that's it. That's the one, they're coming in. Yeah. Because, like, he'd elevated it. Yeah. So you've got to look at it, you've got to go, like, everyone, there's brilliant writers, there's yeah. absolutely brilliant writers, 10 times better than me, who are just writing stuff that's already getting made. Yeah. Like Jimmy said to me, Jimmy McGovern said to me, um, the it'll never get made. Mm. Respond that it'll never get made. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because it's a cop show. And there's brilliant people write cop shows. Mm. How are you gonna write something better than Jeffy Curio? Mm. How are you gonna write something better than, you know, uh Sally Wayne? You're not you're not going to. So I had to go away and go, right, well, how can I not make this a cop show then? And I made it a people show. Mm. And I put the most important person mm. on the first page. And if you remember responding, it opens with him sitting there saying, I just want to be normal. It's open up with that vulnerability. Yeah, I just want to be normal. I just want to be normal. Fucking hell, I'm going to read that. I'm literally going to watch and read that. In yeah. that second, I just want to be normal. What's up with him? Yeah. It's it over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you've got to do. By the way, it's a cop show. Yeah. You literally, you've got to punch them in the face with that first line. Mm. Bang. And then they'll turn over the page. It a good script mm. will get you in. Mm. A good spec script will get you in. It might take longer, but a good, like just purely speculative script, just whack it in there, and eventually someone's gonna pick it up. Mm. Like my literary agent is like he was able to ring up Arthur Collins and go read this first. Um but my television agent, I didn't get him until after he responded. It got picked up. Like the, the best thing about me telly agents is, is that he can prioritise my workload working with different, yeah. you know, productions. So he brings so much to it. But I didn't. Have, I got responded on the back of myself. Mm. You can't put barriers in front of yourself. You've got to go. Like if I haven't got a laptop, mm. I'm gonna write on a pad. Yeah. That's what I did with my first book. I haven't got a laptop, I'm skinned. I haven't got a laptop, I'm like, fuck it, I'll write it on the pad. And I will work and work and work until I get someone gives me a laptop. My brother-in-law yeah. gave me a laptop. 
don't get me wrong, like the same thing, you're like, oh god, I can't do this anymore and all that. But the, it's the ability to just get up again and go again. That's the thing. Do it your way. But like, I didn't have an agent, and it's a good script will always get read. A good actor will always find the stage, even if they've got to make it themselves. You know, within reason, like I don't, you know, don't walk in the rooms that giving out headlocks, like, but although it's come close a couple of times, but you now you've got to say that, like, you know, this is like my story, this is my story, and you know what? If you're good, like, if you're working with a good company and dancing led you're a great company, and the yeah. BBC, I mean, Jesus Christ, the BBC, the brilliant, but if you're good, they will value your input, and if you don't ask, you don't get. Mm -hmm. So, like, when it comes to casting and stuff like that. I was like, I want to be part of this. I want to be part of this journey. And now I'm executive producing. The only reason I'm executive producing that I've got a, like literally a contractual voice in that room yeah. is because I asked for it. You've got to fight for that place in the edit. The edit's the big one. You've got to buy a casting. Mm -hmm. You've got to fight for your place in the edit. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, bow your head today, great in knowledge about the job. Like they've done it 50 times. And I'm sitting there at the first time going, what is this shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. And like, it's, but they're saying, oh, I'm going, we're getting to a place like we're making a bar here. Yeah. You know, it starts off with a lump of clay. Mm -hmm. it, it, we were casting during COVID, which was mm -hmm. a nightmare. Um, because there was just like self-tapes flying around. And some people find that it's a self-tape. I know I do. Robert Stern, who cast the show, would whittle it down, yeah. whittle it down, whittle it down. And then say, we'd get like 10, tapes for each character. There's the other thing as well about casting, which I've learned, which I didn't realise myself when I was acting, is that it isn't necessarily that you, you're not a great actor, it's just that you're just not right for a part. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because we used a couple of people who were, didn't get the part they were going up for. There's a couple of roles, I won't say who, you know, it wouldn't be fair, but there's a couple of roles where we went, oh yeah, hang on, they're brilliant, like, let's use them for this. Or put them to one side, but we'll definitely use them going forward. And we've got names who, like, we've put to one side because I've written characters that I've taught. You know, I've got, like, I can use, you know, for them later on. And it's a team thing. I'm starting to think how many people make decisions on the casting. You've got two at the BBC. Martin was involved because Martin was executive producing. Uh, me. Chris, Becky. So there was seven of us. Yeah making decisions. Yeah. So you've got to kind of come to a point where you all go, all right, well, three don't, four do. Yeah. Uh, Emily fairly played Casey. That was she her first role. School, Literally first role out of school. Mm -hmm. And it was brilliant because you were able to, and it's a gamble, that. Casting like unknown actors is like, it's a proper gamble because they might do a brilliant tape and then you get them on set for the first day and it's like, <laughs> don't yeah. me, you know? Yeah. It's like there's like a hundred people behind the camera. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference from sitting in your bedroom with your mum. And it's like, or with your, you know, with your housemates or something like that. It's really different. So it's a gamble, you know, to do that. And we just, honest to God, we just got jackpots every time. Yeah. The viewpoint of like looking at other BBC dramas, I doubt there's many BBC dramas. That, you know, everything we set out to do on Responder was different. And I think that there are a few BBC dramas who've got Three unknowns mm. in the main, yeah, yeah, the top five, six leads. Mm. We literally went like, let's have three unknowns. Mm. It's mad, yeah. you know. And it was a gamble, like, and Ed, he just didn't let us down. He was amazing. Mm. Someone said to me, um, writing a book and then writing for TV is like being a plumber and being a silly wire a house. But I disagree because I think it's telling a story. And obviously the mechanics of it are different. The layout is different. You know, obviously you've got to get yourself a soft right, uh, screenwriting project, um, program. But it's telling a story. I learned how to tell stories in the pub with the lads. And there used to be an hour fella in the pub where I used to drink when I was about 16 uh, called Mick Morgan. And Mick had been a docker in Liverpool and would sell these big, long, rambling, three-minute, four-minute anecdotes that had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And they had the quest, 
and they had the whole thing at the end with the rug pull. Yeah. They had, it just Mick would tell me stories. And Mick could have been a screenwriter. Definitely. It's just telling stories. Again, it's people put obstacles in your way or you put your own obstacles in the way. That's yeah. more likely. Is that it to me there's no difference. Everyone moves at me because I, I put too much action in me script. But then I I've just put a script in with a, a production company who asked me, where's the where's the action? Like where's the where's all the, the atmosphere and all the the yeah. things? So I've gone away and put it all back in again. Yeah. And it's also a thing is is that like you know, if I write, like, it was a dark and stormy night in the book, you know, and it says, and all this, like, and you put, you know, there was branches tapping at the window and all, you know, crack of lightning, so the lawn lit silver. You write that in a book and everyone goes, that says, you put it in the script and everyone pulls a face, but when the director gets it, he knows exactly what you were thinking. Yeah. He knows exactly what you're thinking. So, you, you know, you need to take out, like, Flourishes that you might put into a script, like literary flourishes that you might put in. You know, you you, sort of, you think you're Byron, you know, you lean back and into your, like, so you, you take them out, yeah. but paint a picture, it's just the same. It's still set the same. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's set it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no difference. Don't put, you know, like, oh, I write books, but I couldn't do this. You can do anything. Yeah. I know it sounds dead sight when you say it, but don't put barriers in front of yourself. You know what? I don't know really because I've only ever done it once and it, it landed the script. So I don't know. I mean, this is the one thing that I might be completely wrong on. When I say this might be the one thing, I'm probably wrong about <laughs> a lot of things. Actually. But I just think if, if if cold outreach is really difficult, isn't it? You want people to get to your script. So if you're sending like, you know, like a, an email that long, yeah. I think you're probably making a mistake. Mm. You want people to read that first page, mm. that killer first character. That's what you want. Um, so for me, it's all about that. If you can write really good dialogue, you will end up working with people in a room who can help you with your story. But writing brilliant, brilliant, brilliant dialogue is what attracts actors, directors, and viewers. That to me is get to the script, yeah. keep it short. You know, obviously you've got to save your air. I don't know, I write emails exactly the same way as I speak, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to remember the email I wrote to LA Productions when I, I sent that first script in, the got option, and I I can almost, almost with a degree of certainty say that I just said, you probably just want to read the script. Yeah, and that was it. Yeah. But being myself. Yeah. I'm not, I'm terrible at networking, again, I'm terrible at it, you know, I'm quite shy as well, like, I'm not really great, like, going into a room full of people who don't know me, um, so I find that it's a lot easier now that I tend to go into rooms that people want me to go into, do you know what I mean, there's nothing worse, I went to a BBC Rice's room thing at, um, in London, with um, in about 300 writers there, and I met a lady called Helen Black, and me and her, a crap at networking. And it was just that we were the two who were standing in the corner, admiring everyone else who could network. Mm. And yet, probably, I might be wrong, me and her, out of the 300 people in there, are the only ones who've had something made by the BBC. Yeah. So I don't think network, networking is the be all and end all, but I do think it is nice to have someone that you can talk to about what yeah. you're doing, you know. And also, it's nice as well, like, because you never know, you know. That, I might have a project, or she might have a project down the line, which might be a bit of work. You know, that's a big thing. Work, work's a funny word, isn't it? You, you've got to treat it like work. Mm. Networking, you've got to treat that like work. You know, writing the script, it's got to be like work. You should never, ever, 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 ever just do it for a bit of fun. Yeah. It's just got to, even if you're not getting paid, mm. it's your fucking job. Mm. You know, I want to do this for the job. I'm just not being paid for it yet. It's my job. I've got to take it that seriously. Mm. And, you know, it's like set yourself times. This is my job. Mm. Even if I can only afford to do it for half an hour a day, mm. it's a part time job. Go and do it. I think it would have been be yourself. Mm. 
I think that'd be the one for me. Just be yourself. Don't, don't like. I mean, that's so trite, isn't it? That's the worst bit of advice <laughs> anyone has ever given it. But I think that I, I think I've gotten further, faster, by not pretending to be anyone else. I think I might be wrong. Like, I'm probably if I'd been a bit posher, I probably would have had an Oscar by now. But I, I genuinely think like just being completely honest mm. is that's it. So actually, I've got a few bits of advice. Okay. Don't be scared to reach out to people and go, I want to do this, can you help me? Now, don't like batter my Twitter because I'm just going to ignore you. <laughs> but don't be afraid. I mean, I'm mentioning like about, I've got, I think I'm mentioning about six writers at the moment who've asked me for help. Mm. Why not? Mm. You know, that, there's nothing wrong with that. Just don't stop thinking about it when you're not writing. It's like, even if you're, you know, people say like, well, I've only got time to write for half an hour. So, You've got all day to think about it. Mm. Even if, like, I've got an eight-month-old baby. Mm. I was literally wrestling with him this morning, she's not happy. I was still thinking about working. Mm. You've just got to live in them moments and live with them characters. Yeah. So that's the big thing for me, is, is just think about it constantly. Mm. Become, it's like an obsession. It has to become an obsession. Yeah. My final thing it would be is, is if you want it badly enough and believe that you should be there, and you've got to fight harder than anyone else. You've got to really, really fight harder than anyone else. And like, just because you're working class or just because you come from a certain background, it, like, you've just got to see that as a reason to fight harder yeah. than anyone else. Yeah. That's what you've got to do.